The Epistemology of State Emotion by Lauren Berlant. Politics is the art of suppressing the political, Jacques Ranciere. 1. A Political Weather Report. Nuance quickly became a moral buzzword of the George W. Bush administration. Even to pursue nuanced thought was deemed a performative performance of anti-patriotism, linking dissent and amorality with a kind of pedantry that others might call critical intellectualism or just close reading. The ideology's radiant reign began in June 2001 with Peggy Noonan's A Chat in the Oval Office, during which the president spoke in broad strokes about the significant post-Cold War potential opened up by Russia joining NATO, while acknowledging that, I haven't thought about the nuance of it. But the most noteworthy presidential usage came during an April interview on Britain's ITV. President Bush remarked, Sure, people have. Look, my job isn't to try to nuance. My job is to tell people what I think. And when I think there's an axis of evil, I say it. I think moral clarity is important, if you believe in freedom. And people can make all kinds of excuses, but there are some truths involved. Subsequent debates between Bush administration officials and those who disagreed with their policies were frequently phrased in terms of pro-Bush characterizations of nuance as something between pedantic nuisance and genuine treason. Meanwhile, the anti-Bush public responds to anti-nuance epistemology in kind, condemning the president's apparent incompetence at or refusal of reason in terms that range from charges of stupidity to anti-democratic, even fascist authoritarianism. Each side feels strongly that its way of knowing secures the relevant facts in support of political and moral right. Nuance. French, from Middle French. Shade of color, from Nuer, to make shades of color. From Nu, cloud. From Latin nubes, perhaps akin to Welsh nude, mist. Date, 1781. 2. Visceral Politics. Providing a context for debate debates about state power, economy, and community, thereby helping to shape the practices of the representative state, has been considered the main function of the public sphere. This essay contests the notion and norm of political rationality as the core practice of democracy in the United States by considering the national political sphere not as a real or ideal scene of abstraction-oriented deliberation, but as a scene for the orchestration of public feelings, of the public's feelings, of feelings in public, of politics as a scene of emotional contestation. The import of this shift from the notion of a rational critical public to an effective public is both conceptual and historical, and does not deny the ongoing operation of cognition in the political sphere. While the political sphere is not devoid of rational thought, its dominant rhetorical style is to recruit the public to see political attachments as an amalgam of reflexive opinion and visceral or gut feeling, visceral, from the Latin viscera, intestine. The folding of thought into feeling modes of personal expressivity is not a sign of the decline of democracy or civil society per se, though. Feelings are not the opposite of thought. Each is an embodied his rhetorical register associated with specific practices, times, and spaces of appropriateness. Nor are feelings less abstract than thought. Distinguishing these categories typically involves decisions about whether certain emotions conventionally associated with bodily reactivity have more or less value because of their seemingly expressive immediacy. Why should cognition seem more cultivated than emotion, since both are shaped by formal and informal pedagogies? My view is that this distinction is mainly normative, like emotion, co like emotion, cognition involves bodily responses, but while emotional expressivity is deemed spontaneous and hardwired, cognition's conventional modes of response escape notice, except where they are admired as fine manifestations of self-control. This essay tells a story about the war on terror currently pursued by the Bush administration in the aftermath of the Pentagon and the World Trade Center attacks of 2001. What does it tell us about the political sphere, that the government has deemed it a plausible strategy of consensus making to wage war not on terrorism or terrorists as such, but on terror, a feeling, a feeling deemed evidence of injustice and justification for state antinomianism? The vague, shapeless, and pseudo-transparent qualities of terror and the relative autonomy of terror from events and agents make it possible for the government to motivate a situation of unending war and juridical crisis as though these practices constitute the just response of a representative state to the felt needs of its citizens.
The emotional tonalities of this administration are not unprecedented politically. The history of the U.S. political modernity registers a shift of priority within normative performative power styles from the rational circuit of opinionated argument to the visceral performance of moral clarity, which then may be supported by argument and evidence, but not of the sort traditionally taught by involving hypotheses and ordered proof. I do not mean to argue, though, that sensationalism, hyperbole, and passionate irrationality are particular to the U.S. 20th century, the political sphere, or the contemporary right wing. Absolutist and democratic authoritarian and progressive regimes of power have long generated moral, hyperbolic, dominant, and oppositional rhetorical modes. But during the U.S. 20th century, an emotional style linked to moral claims about truth and justice increasingly came to dominate ordinary political speech. The following sections of this essay sort out some aspects of the place of emotional epistemology in the work of moralist politics in the U.S. political public sphere, moving among symptomatic cases of the expressive performance style of World War II-era popular anti-fascism, the right-wing paranoid style of subsequent Cold War political performance, and the wielded presumptions of religious, affective, and moral clarity of the Republican right in the United States. In doing... In so doing, I am charting a genealogy of right-wing anti-federalist rhetorical affectivity, for I think the centrality of emotion to the claim to be viscerally and morally above politics goes far to explain the Bush administration's style of response to the crisis. I could also have focused on the effectivity of the anecdote in Ronald Reagan's rhetoric, or the space of derision and permission opened up by Bill Clinton's eloquent emotional openness to the suffering of others, were I trying only to make the broader case about the rise of the more emo moral emotional rhetoric from a marginal to a dominant idiom of power. This essay moves towards understanding the current relationship between moral effective publicness and the Bush administration's political practice. We can pursue this development along technological lines as well. Mass culture theorist Mass culture theorists describe the centrality of the sense of liveness to the electronically mediated experience of national belonging, an affective experience of the world of events that comes to consume as though immediate or made even more live and alive through the you were there qualities of radio, television, video, and film. Liveness shapes the consumers of mass media into a public that has become such an so, become such by encountering events marked by others as making the collective experience of now, now being a space, and time-making event deemed important as the present moment of a future history. This means that, insofar as the public is presumed to be identical with the polity, national publicness is a normative effect of communications that show to the public events that are already cast as constituting the collective experience of the national present. This is what Noam Chomsky via Walter Lippmann means by manufactured consent. Note the complex temporalities here. A subjective public experience of the present as a historical period is constituted by a pre-framing of events X as a collectively significant at, a, at an obs observational meta-level, regardless of content. Not only is the political spectator deemed already to have consented to the priorities of the now hegemonic event, but she is also solicited to feel the impact that provides, provides evidence that she belongs to the public constituted as the mass of spectators who sees what she sees and feels what she feels within a range of appropriate variation. Even more paradoxically, insofar as the citizen of liveness is moved rather than moving, the collective experience of social belonging privatizes her at the same time as it provides a subject experience of participation in publicness. How is this possible? Publicness is a zone of collective intimacy that does not require anyone meeting anyone else face to face, the very spatial abstractness of concepts like public and polity enable, theoretically, anyone's identification with and by them. Regardless of one's particular view about their own participation in the generalized public, subjects who live somewhere are connected to each other insofar as they recognize the performative force of formal law and the authority of informal customs of social projection. In this sense, publicness requires individual recognition of the juridical constraints on individuality. At the same time, the mass-mediated scene of visceral engagement attaches personal to public experience and enables consuming subjects to have strong responses that seem to place them squarely in the emotional stream of collective life. The intensified impact of liveness can produce subjects who feel that life that is reported to be elsewhere without having to leave the home space. In this zone of privacy, it's easy to imagine one's private consumption of particular events as scenes of genuine public trauma or joy. Emotions can feel central to the national popular domain without being especially political. 
Indeed, the emotional connection to other spectators, also consuming history, takes place at the same time that we see merging a sense of privacy as personal political irrelevance and or safety from the harder realities of historic instability. Reality TV exists where there is no privacy. These paradoxes of space and time in the privately experienced collective event can produce a sense of relief. The domestic sight of consumed history seems to slow the pace of the world, along with the protecting spectators from scrutiny and the vulnerabilities of encountering people and power outside the home. At the same time, consumer citizenship is always at least one step behind the mass event. The glorious sense of having avoided the risk of being vulnerable in public or to a, pu or to a public can also be experienced as a feeling of powerlessness and irrelevance, for if one can mainly watch and listen, or if one refuses to participate in the we that so often accompanies the feel, one's response has no impact beyond the personal zone. It is a small step from privatized national participation to a sense of political irrelevance to a turning away from politics as a zone of imagined agency as the vast majority of voting age Americans have done. Consumer citizenship in this regard draws a line between the degraded public sphere and the social membership in the consumer sphere, the realm of pleasure and ordinary survival. The private performance of public emotion in these senses can further isolate subjects from experiencing or challenging the structural and judicial terms of the collectiveness of their collective histories. If the subject does identify her membership in the public of a larger, often national public world in terms of her mass-mediated responses to it, we can be sure she will be called into experience her affect slash opinion in terms of normative moral hierarchies. Where liveness as history is concerned, the performative presentist body genres, sensationalist news and narrative political melodrama, docu-tragedy and docu-comedy, for example, shuttle between the negative emotions related to the personally felt threat and scenes that sustain and give moral distinction to the attachments to the comforts of normativity, even if the conditions for the ideal normative good life have not actually existed. Any consequences of this shifting relation for a given event are historically specific, of course. But the paradox of the political culture of true feeling, that the experience of historical liveness relies on a sense that private visceral activity is at the core of political participation, is especially alive in modern liberal nationalisms. By true feeling, I refer to an argument I've made elsewhere, that around 1830 a shift in emphasis with respect to the ethics of the Enlightenment subjectivity emerged in the elite sectors of the United States, which challenged rationality as the core activity distinguishing the human being. Supplanting the universal primacy of human cognition was an image of the person as a subject with moral feeling, and especially with a capacity for feeling and responding to the suffering of the less fortunate, who could be described as others, not as individuals, but as members of a subordinated population. In contrast to the project of constitutional universalism, which focused on the simultaneity of individual and national autonomy and self-development, the growth of the liberal state in response to anti-slavery, feminist, and pro-indigenous rights activism, among other forces, was an effect of the promotion of the pain capacity as a ground of the human as such. The universalization of pain made a new pathway to citizenship. Social activists came to demand of free citizens a kind of moral cognition that the perception of injustice means nothing without the compassion, and compassion was seen as a public emotion, as a motive for transformative practice, an idea that all subjects were emotionally identical in their pain and suffering, and therefore imaginable by each other, became the basis of arguments for national belonging. At the same time, the coming to precedence of visceral politics required the presumption that certain effective responses come to humans from something like natural law, such that to feel emotion X in response to injustice was to be morally authorized in the political sphere. Behind all this is the Christian religious sense of compassion as a fundamental social ligament. In the Protestant entailment woven through U.S. constitutional and liberal history, this relational affect was thought to bring one into the experience of others such that one comes to understand their destiny as tied with, in with one's own. Social transformation in this view was not at root a structural event, but an emotional one. One's availability to experience identification with a capacity for experience located inside the subordinated other would lead one to desire uplift or emancipation for that person or population. This sentimental moral psychology became a vehicle for delivering virtue to the privileged, who got to feel good about themselves for having the appropriate feelings about the subordinated kind of person or population. At the same time, unsurprisingly, sentimental solicitation has been an extremely effective motor of social change, challenging and extending operative definitions of the human.
As time has passed, a meta-discourse about true feeling has developed. During the 20th century, a visceral, visual version of the U.S. political sphere tapped into the spectacular aspects of what Tom Gunning has called the cinema of attractions. Gunning argues that early cinema's grammar of attractions was exhibitionist, articulated around the real as spectacle. The cinematic sign was fundamentally there to be seen and internalized as immediate experience, even if the represented world was far from the one in which the spectator lived, and despite the notions of causality and change so central to what has become the narrativity of classic Hollywood cinema. In turn, television has elaborated these norms of what we might call emotional humanism, relying on the successful broadcast of scenes of intense emotion to serve as lubricant for a particular experience of social belonging, whether in terms of the traditional patriotic national symbolic, the carceral state, a polity of television consumers, or a collective of free autonomous individuals living in a mass-mediated simultaneity. This is why the emotional transparency of melodrama is so central to the docudramatic production and dissemination of a generalized publicness. The airwaves are saturated with incitements to keep citizens linked to each other through the belief that the ex version of experience they see digested on screen is composed of their own, the public's own, simultaneous, spontaneous, identical, and fully fleshed out sensations in response to events deemed clearly worthy of noticing in a particular way. Melodramatic reality genres, generating a thread of affect that binds consumers to multiple kinds of publicness, emphasize the ethical and political demands of the negative emotions, especially in the domain of pain. The experience of self-disrupting, subjective, and socially rooted pain has become such a universalizing force that any individual's emotions of social discomfort can be argued for as a transparent self-evidence for the existence of injustice. Now it is possible for anyone to claim that challenges to their desire for an unconflicted world have produced the kind of pain that ought to set in motion the recuperative justice implied by the moral effective contract of liberal personhood and politics I've just described. As though all pain were equivalently evidence of injustice, this view authorizes the kind of moral outrage previously deemed appropriate only in response to structural oppression. Elsewhere, I have noted the emergence of this subject of imperiled privilege during the era of Reaganite cultural politics. This subject, not structurally subordinated, radiates sanctity and sanctimony. The liberal religious genealogy of the culture of true feeling reemerges as moral outrage when the privilege no longer feels secure as worthy of default respect or deference. Political theorist Wendy Brown has claimed recently that what we might call the moral turn abets left and progressive political paralysis as well as right-wing power consolidation. While moralizing discourse symptomizes impotence and aimlessness with regard to making a future, it also marks a peculiar relationship to history, one that holds history responsible, even morally culpable, at the same time as it evinces a disbelief in history as a teleological force. When belief in the continuity and forward movement of historical forces is shaken, even as those forces appear so powerful as to be very nearly determining, the passionate political will is frustrated in all attempts to gain satisfaction as, at history's threshold. It can acquire neither the account of the present nor any future there. The perverse triple consequence is a kind of moralizing against history in the form of condemning particular events or utterances, personifying history in individuals, and disavowing history as a productive or transformative force. End quote. Brown complains here about left moralism, an emotionally trumping rhetoric that overvalues the negative emotions over the total critique or positive program and that ends up overfocusing on eradicating a subjective rather than structural effects of injustice. Brown's excellent analysis located in the left, a will to replace the agonism and con contradictions evident in historical struggle with a struggle against contradiction itself, and I think she's right to suggest that a politics of moral hierarchy tends to sublimate history onto a field of ahistorical truths. However, her emphasis on the self-undermining of the left political practice indicates implicitly that its moralizing tendencies come from an internal theoretical or political wrong turning. I have tried to suggest otherwise here. The moral effective tendency in the U.S. politics belongs to no political field per se, and has a long history whose modern presidential watermark is in pro and anti-FDR polemic, and requires an analysis of the effective norms of the political sphere as such. In particular, we need to understand the consequences of the claim that emotions provide the best material from which determinations about justice are made.
As other essays in this volume suggest, the state inculcation of anti-fascist and anti-communist feeling during the 1940s and 1950s looms as a direct predecessor of the current state of orchestration of anti-terror emotion. During the 1950s, many dissenting intellectuals and artists were publicly and tacitly presumed to be un-American, inhuman, perverse, and or evil, not for refusing the centrality of pain to the definition of the human, but for refusing to agree that the domain of unquestionable moral clarity extended from that pain, a moral clarity from which a particular project of justice could be advanced. This view did not comprise anti-intellectualism as such, but only the knowledge and the aesthetic production deemed worthy but the only knowledge and aesthetic production deemed worthy was that which supported the anti-communist Cold War moral view. Now we have moved from the only thing we have to fear is fear itself to visions of terror as the central feeling of our historical moment. For all sorts of reasons, the contemporary shift does not merely repeat the earlier developments in state emotionalism. Still, to understand the Bush administration's vernacular of the viscera, its effort to put politics as the practice of moral transparency rather than juridical validity, we need some sense of the genealogy of consensual practices to which we have become accustomed in the U.S. political sphere. What does it mean to measure the scale of an event or scene through an emotional epistemology? How has the convention of elaborating moral stances from an ostensibly transparent emotional experience shaped the orchestration of crisis in U.S. politics? Anti-communist and anti-terrorist campaigns related to the fear of foreigners who have been surreptitiously breached, who have surreptitiously breached the national boundaries, have marked central moments in the normalizing of state emotionalism as the strategy of social binding in the U.S. political sphere. This essay archives three cases for nuancing these questions. The first uses the 1943 film Tender Comrade to look at a state-approved style of visceral politics introduced by the fascist crisis in the 1930s and beyond. The second the example of HUAC as the scene of the right's implementation of outrage for visceral politics, the last at the current administration's media campaign to use terror to terrorize and pacify the polity and to motivate it to delegate knowledge to the state. Tender Comrade in the 1943 film Tender Comrade, four women with soldier husbands pool their wages in order to rent a comfortable house in which to wait for their men to return. Although of different ages, classes, and ethnic origins, the women know each other from work in what the film showcases as spectacularly modernist Douglas Aircraft Plant, all light and hygienic and cathedral-like. In contrast, the home that they keep is thoroughly Victorian, a virtual diorama of nostalgic housekeeping. But this disjuncture in historical style goes only style deep. Both spaces endorse a nationalist project that involves the women's embrace of democracy as a discipline, with its techniques of the self oriented to the liberal project of the general will. Helen, played by Patricia Collins. It's only fair to point out that we're all different people, and there might be a clash of personalities occasionally. We'd have to find some way of adjusting any disputes that come up. Joe, played by Ginger Rogers. Why, that ought to be simple. We could take a vote. We could run the joint like a democracy, and if anything comes up, we could call a meeting, share and share alike. During the red-beating season of the decade after 1947, these lines and tender comrade were brandished as evidence that a subterranean social movement of seditious artist communists had infiltrated Hollywood with the purpose of infecting national fantasy. In particular, Layla Rogers testified to the House Un-American Act activities committee that her daughter ginger joe jones had demonstrated real patriotism in objecting to the subversive proximity of the word democracy to share and share alike rogers maintained that through this exchange and others tender comrade intended to lure the american audience to associate the optimism of love plots with the anticipation of socialism and the practical agency of homemaking with the practice of equality no matter what the Federal Office of War Information had actually supervised the production of Tender Comrade, deeming it an excellent example of pro-war propaganda for its depiction of women's wartime pr proprieties, no matter what the title Tender Comrade comes not from a communist greed but from the anodyne Robert Louis Stevenson poem My Wife, Dalton Trumbo, the author of these lines, was blacklisted in Hollywood from 1947 through 1960, serving 11 months in prison for contempt of Congress. He refused to name names. But the film's message about the relation of the personal and the political is actually far more incoherent than this national sl capitalist slash national socialist narrative would suggest. Among the many stock female housemate characters is a hard woman and adulteress, Barbara Taylor, played by Ruth Hussey, who dates men on the domestic front while her Casanova husband is in the Navy dallying, she presumes, with a woman in every port. 
Taylor refuses her patriotic duty to pass the war abstemiously, working with women and waiting for her man to return. Amidst the tangle of tough girl language and brazen gesture, small facial shots of flickering upset reveal to the audience that Taylor is a softie and not too far beneath the surface. The housemates, though, cannot read her subtle signs and hector her constantly for over-enjoying sex, lipstick, meat, and other rationed sensual and oral pleasures. In one scene, Taylor explodes at her housemates for their intensely normative moral orations on the topic of marriage and militarism, and as she does this, she dissents from the sacrificial project of a familialized U.S. nationalism. Quote, this thing wouldn't have happened in the first place if we were minding our own business. Even the government doesn't know what it's going to do tomorrow. Blow hot, blow cold, he's up, he's down. What kind of business is that anyway? And while we're being pushed around at home, our guys are out fighting in countries they haven't even heard of for a lot of foreigners who will turn on us like a pack of wolves the minute it's, minute it's over. Joe Jones, Ginger Rogers, the film's equally strident protagonist, responds to her intimate enemy. Quote, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Do you know where that kind of talk comes from? It comes straight from Berlin. Every time you say, every time you even think it, you're double-crossing your own husband. How can we go on minding our own business when somebody blackjacks us in an alley? You got Pearl Harbor on your hands. And who wants to get slick and fat when half the people in this world are starving to death? And of plenty of things you can, we can do without. Mistakes. Sure, we make mistakes. Plenty of them. You want a country where they won't stand for a mistake? Go to Germany. Go to Japan. And the first time you open your trap like you have tonight, you'll find a gun in your stomach. You're the kind of people Hitler counted on when he started this war. Talk, 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 and never think. And that's the biggest mistake any guy ever thought of making, because there's not enough of you, and there are plenty of us. Glenn quote. If we were interested in understanding the film's relation to the historical world in which patriotism and dissent are here debated, we would have a hard time gleaning a coherent worldview from either of the women's speeches. Both speeches are patriotic. While Barbara Taylor is clearly anti-FDR, she performs rhetorically her view of this failure to be politically consistent by mixing up her own different dissenting positions, shuttling between isolationist and xenophobic vagueness, along with voicing the indignation of the little guy who resents being pushed around by the big state. Constructed of a rickety pile of cliches, her oppositional vernacular sounds more like an unfiltered blurt than a considered opinion. Joe Jones responds in a pro-FDR fashion of a sort, lumping together Hitler, Berlin, Japan, and indeed any express resistance to the am am ambitions of U.S. hegemony. In the jumble of phrases, Rogers proclaims fascistic genocide, military violence, ordinary crimes against property, political dissent, and adultery indistinguishable from each other, fellow travelers tainted by association. Dissenters are dangerous because they do not think, and also because they do think, immorally. Anyway, if you dissent, you aid the enemy and subvert your own husband, so it is virtually adulterous and reasonous, treasonous if you dissent, but if you do, it is a tribute to the United States that you are free to transgress and disagree without getting mugged by the state. And anyway, America will win the war because there are no more there are more good guys than bad, and anyway predictably. In the film, the women's argument gets cut short by the radio, which announces dramatically the death and combat of Taylor's wayward husband. The pro war patriotic stance wins by a KO. But in the prior moment of polemic vitriol, when all potential impediments to the U.S. project meld into a mega enemy, when the adulterer figures as a marital and political cheat who performs the threatening collapse of social order during a time of crisis, all transgressions seem reasonably characterized as at the same scale and in the same species of treason. All opposition leads to death. Any death suggests the potential end of something else, including the whole system. Such a clustering of distinct things into a relation that makes them appear foundationally interconnected constitutes what Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe would call a logic of equivalence. In Tender Comrade, irration irrationally articulated patriotic views take on the sound of explaining the world equivalently well, but they remain untested because resolved by the brutal interruptus of death. Then why bother taking time to depict the women's debate at all, since it turns out to be an episode irrelevant to the succeeding events? The title, Tender Comrade, telegraphs a relation of private life to political continuity in a way that suggests a heartbeat of tenderness between the soldier's tough veneer. But in the United States after 1917, this vernacular sense of comrade was inflected towards the sense of the word under Russian communism and international socialism, where comrade seemed equivalent with citizen, while suggesting economic solidarity as the collective glue rather than the individuality or private property. In 1943, Russia was still a U.S. ally. By 1947, the word comrade pres presumed more ominous tones. <laughs> 
During World War II, the film title's metaphor clearly meant to bind women to U.S. patriotism, marking the disposition of daily lives at work and at home as military activity akin to that of the life-and-death struggles of their soldier husbands. At the same time, though, it turns out that the women citizens the film portrays are ideally wholly private, not quite citizens. If their economic camaraderie does signal a socialist desire on Trumbo's part, the use of the word comrade in the film also suggests the informal ways women participate in national culture through the power of intimate bonds. Still, there is a difference between women's bonds with the other women and with husbands. The truly tender comrade is the husband's best friend, the wife. During the war, women are each other's tender comrades, producing material support while waiting for the real thing to come home. In order for the democratic nation to remain strong and free, then, a tender comrade must remain tender, must remain what a woman should be. She can work like a man and use women, in the meanwhile, to remain effectively alive. Most importantly, though, is not what she thinks politically, or even what she does, but that she maintains the proper emotional orientation to the husband and to the nation. For the tender comrade is in the structural position to draw a red thread through the nation from the heart to the head of state. When the adulterous one initiates the collapse of venerated hierarchies of value and order, she violates the social function of marital love ideology, which is to make people experience a legal obligation as an expression of the heart's true desire. To love love is to love the law. In times of political crisis, there is no greater love. In these ways, Tender Comrade narrates both marital love and patriotism as in a kind of danger that must be counteracted emotionally. In this regard, it is a classically liberal text, with its tests of individual good intention. It is also a classically modern text, for a number of reasons. First, as many scholars and theorists have argued, U.S. modernity has been especially associated with the figure of the woman, insofar as her story figures as a material and symbolic problem of distinctly modern appetites and their regulation. Second, the film's relation to narrative is fundamentally psychological, constantly looking for a real underneath the women's surface. This is to say that certain stress is revealed in the system. The aspect of governmentality most salient during and after the war involved, in the, involved the conscription of citizens not to have secrets, to be transparent to their immediate and national politics. As Michael Rogan and others point out, the communist could not be racialized effectively, except occasionally as the Asian or the Jew, thus a mass paranoia at the specter of the perversely visible normal was encouraged. Yet while the film promotes a scheme of self-policing and social scrutiny, it is also comically and seriously aware that subjects are never transparent to themselves or to each other. It suggests that because of the unconscious and the ideological, Americans are required to monitor even more intensely. The impossibility of transparency makes these models of citizen psychology incommensurate. Sexuality, with its jumble of intentional and irrational practices, comes to figure the dangers to the state of this incommensurateness. Relevant here is Foucault's claim that a particularly sexualized mode of modern civilization has used intimate relations to make economic, institutional, aesthetic, and everyday practices appear as fundamentally psychological, emotional, and moral emanations. But even if there is a certain broad historical simultaneity to the emergence of the normal in the domain of the human, these categories are not identical matrices of explanation. This discussion of tender comrade aims to detail some of the particular political unity of their amalgamation under the rubric of sexuality, seen as that most human thing that disrupts the human. Insofar as sexuality denotes the most intimate of social exchanges, it serves as a vehicle for regulating social interdependency and containing irrationality into the process of individuation. During crisis times, the hegemonic bloc, in this case the liberal nation, needs citizens to activate patriotic attachment as though it were a psychological mode. At stake in the prosecution within and about tender comrade, then, is a national capitalist depiction of power and justice in terms of moral clarities and emotional comforts, one whose shape changes throughout the 1940s and 1950s, but whose dedication to national hegemony does not. Justice is depicted as a visceral reaction of individuals, and public debate takes the form of a disagreement about whose transparent feelings best measure the evident state of things. The idea that feelings are transparent to subjects becomes ideologically continuous with the moral claim for the clarities of a certain brand of patriotism.
Thus, we might say that the rhetorical incoherence of the women's speeches supports a patriotic cause not despite but because they are constructed of cliché clusters. In times of real or manufactured political crisis, it is especially likely that the dead speech of the cliché will return in its ghostly garb, not only as senseless farce, but also as a genuine and interested attempt to create continuity with the, with the pre-crisis world. In this way, some potentially destabilizing aspects of crisis being managed can be neutralized or even reclothed as stabilities. Meanwhile, marital love, national patriotism, private property, and freedom to dissent can appear to be linked structurally because, as ideological cliches, ways of life that carry normative weight, and in ordinary syntax, they are placed in rhetorical proximity to each other. In this way, German and Japanese aggression can become phrased as an adulterous instance of personal violation, a gun in the national stomach, a mugging on a global scale. The clarity of the cliché cluster converted to moral metaphor claims to express a deeper and higher truth than the surfaces of rationality can provide. The cliché is to moral political rhetoric what the true feeling is to emotional humanism. Together they produce an image of citizen subjectivity oriented around a defensive attachment to convention. This is why anyone who says otherwise, who asks for nuance, or seeks to measure degrees of magnitude, is to be revealed as a dangerous thinker. Mass politics of the 20th century has witnessed the formation of a mode of political performativity that conventionalizes particular tones of voice as themselves guarantors of the truths that we know emotionally, even if our clarities are tangled up with false intellectual claims by those who dare to brandish nuance in the face of what a moral person deeply already knows. A thinker is deemed threatening when a particular historical block needs its view of order both to be taken for granted and to be newly embraced in a kind of recommitment ritual. When nationalists use maritable, mar marital compliance not only as an analogy but also as a mechanism of patriotic solidarity, they seek to establish their view as not merely just and morally right but also as an ahistorical value that needs to be reanimated in practice. The moral obligations of love do not require the nuance of rational argument. In fact, such nuance is a transgression against the higher truth that anyone interested in truth could see and should desire. In contrast, the dissenting thinker seems deliberately to refuse to acknowledge the moral and emotional clarities a good person would seek. Dangerous thinkers in this view might as well be destroying love as, a challenging, as challenging the state. I have suggested that, in Tender Comrade, the moral education of virtue and subversion is vocalized in political incoherence on all sides. The non-event status of the women's debate illustrates its conventionality, but more than that, too. Trumbo decries the early 20th century right-wing degrading process of politics as magic and incantation as intellect in the modern United States. Debate is equally and paradoxically monologic. The political sphere is manifested through the serial performance of one passionate rant after another, at the scale of authoritarian passion with diva-esque sentimental or melodramatic tonalities. Indeed, in the contemporary scene, the word rant, popularized by the comedian Dennis Miller, has become the predominant genre for the public expression of political opinion. Many other political films manifest the same convention, partly parodically, no doubt, to the extent that mainstream politics is deemed to generate meaningless or predicate or prevaricating, prevaricating speech, but also, I contend, because at stake is not the idea being promoted but the emotional threat and payoff performed. Thus, while we may not be surprised by the incoherence of political rhetoric, it would be a mistake to think of these rhetorical messes as failures to produce articulate persuasion. The pitting of a moral epistemology against a rational one via the notion of authentic emotion is a rhetorical political convention for the production of what Gramsci calls passive revolution. Passive revolution is a vehicle for producing mass consent to a view as though it were already taken for granted and should need no arguing for. Ethico-emotional performance in the political sphere clearly aims to instantiate such a guarantee. Elaine Hadley has suggested that a melodramatic mode of political speech saturated late Victorian England before the electronic media recorded the grain of the voice, but at the same time that the political sphere absorbed a much larger and more class-diverse polity. She argues that melodramatic conventions of political theatricality were crucial to the political sphere for a number of reasons, two of which seem relevant to this essay's more modern genealogical attempt. 
Hadley argues that the melodrama was the favorite mode of popular theater in the 19th century England, a popularity that stood in direct contrast with the equally emotional but more elite containments of romantic poetry. Thus, if the 18th century saw political satire as its chosen hyperbolic genre of critique, during the 19th century, expanding political participation relied on a more popular genre to mark out the field of power. Hadley also point, points out that during this period, the British state was beginning to taxonomize and rank its populations more meticulously and discriminatingly than it had done in pre-industrial times. The enumeration of populations through census and other modes of categorization can be read as the dialectical other of the hyper-emotional political rhetoric that she describes as the melodramatic mode. As we will see, this dialectic is visible again during the Cold War, and at the present moment, the iconicity of the designated enemy is constituted by its supposed veiledness, its open secrecy, whether behind the Iron Curtain, in caves and cells, or through networks of spies and mobile phones. Thus, when historians of the Cold War talk about the ideology of containment, we can read the metaphor strongly as the state will to formalism that also intensified a ravenous paranoia whose epistemological hunger must never be satisfied. This is why, as Ellen Schrecker and others have archived stunningly, universities and entertainment industries were deemed sites of potentially spreading counter-hegemonic negativity. It was feared that an anti-democratic, anti-American ideology was being made desirable through the pleasures of entertainment and the authority of academic knowledge. In response to this fear of left-wing magic, the state-located affect culture of the United States that disseminated this view took on a bizarre counterintuitive sh shape. Dating from the rise of the House Un-American Activities Committee, rhetorical norms of melodramatic political affect contravened the message of state ration rationality or coolness. The terror produced by secret insurgents reappeared as a virtually homeopathic threat in the grandstanding of members of the hegemonic bloc, whose actuarial, fictionalizing, and polemical grandiosity is realistically reproduced in the Manchurian Candidate. Images of Senator Joseph McCarthy waving pieces of paper, yelling point of order in a disorderly manner, condense this paradoxical political style. The televised hearings show the range of McCarthy's moral outrage, from passionately emotional tones to understatedly threatening ones. Witnesses arguing for the shame and decency in response were actually confirming that this war for the national political heart was an emotional one. Each side's tonality seeks performatively to enact its claim of emotional authenticity, telegraphing a personal connection to a supra-political truth on which U.S. democracy is said to depend. The House on American Activities Committee. The historian Eli Zaretsky locates the origin of right-wing polemical sentimentality in the three anti-communist hysterias of the early century, dating from around 1917, 1930, and then throughout the 1950s, the period in which HUAC did its most effective work. Zaretsky argues that the right's desire to defeat the New Deal has since organized a mode of hysterical and anti-political politics. Redbaiting stirs up an image of the fearless, courageous patriot who looks strong by refusing the status quo of soft appearances and tough deceptions. As the shapeless enemy infiltrates the ranks of power, slowly and secretly shifting its norms towards treason and perversion of the American way of life, the radical conservative embraces outrage in all of its tonalities to protect the passivity of the innocent American, otherwise seduced or taken unawares. Appropriately for historians of the present as the liveness effect, the HUAC hearings were the first political trials of the 20th century televised live to a mass audience. In this early moment of you are there visual national experience, in which the state's embodiment in official persons became evident to millions of citizens simultaneously, what appeared was not what Peter Stearns has called American cool, with its bourgeois sense of measure and scale, but a political style of aggressive, conservative affect on behalf of a sentimental national character so fragile it needed guarding by ferocious martinets. While the cause of law and order provided the explicit referent, political style took on a humanist populist guise of visceral emotionality, associating conservatism and proper patriotism with belief in and access to the higher common sense of the deeper human truths. In contrast to the vernacular incoherence of the women arguing politics in Tender Comrade, the political vernacular of political elites during the Cold War married moral panic and rationality. An, except, an excellent specimen of this idiom of power is available in this HUAC document, the opening sentences of which chronicle a meeting of artists and intellectuals in New York City in 1954. Quote, 
Parading under the imposing title of the Scientific and Cultural Conference for World Peace, the gathering at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City on March 25th, 26th, and 27th, 1949, was actually a super mobilization of the, the inveterate wheel horses and supporters of the Communist Party and its auxiliary organizations. It was, in a sense, a glorified pyramid club, pyramiding into one inflated front the names which had time and again been used by the communists as decoys for the entrapment of innocence. The communist front connections of these sponsors, as reflected in the tabulation on this report, are very extensive. One person has been affiliated with at least 85 communist front organizations. Three persons have been affiliated with from 71 to 80 communist front organizations, four have been affiliated with from 51 to 60 communist front organizations, eight have been affiliated with from 51 to 50, 41 to 50, 10 have been affiliated with from 31 to 40, 28 have been affiliated from, one, from 21 to 30, and 234 have been affiliated with from 1 to 10 communist front organizations." End quote. This document, the Review of the Scientific and Cultural Conference for World Peace, stunningly locates long lists of numbers and names along with paranoia about secrecy, front organizations, decoys, and other modes of false entrapment technology. Celebrities and intellectuals on the left are defined as soldier aggressors in a culture war who fight dirty by deploying the higher and lower pleasures, excess measured by the nth degree of resistance. In this mode, the excessive fact list is in the moral truth in contrast to artists' immoral critical reflections. HUAC locates the scale of the event by swinging between foregrounding a potential miasma of anti-normative, anti-national excess and the stack of hot numerical facts. I have suggested that McCarthy, like many anti-communist rhetoricians, was a master of emotional performance. Mobilizing disgust and outraged moral clarity, he marked paranoia as the appropriate response of the just mind to the deviousness of the unjust, and manifested the triumph of facts in the face of the explicit and hidden deceits of the dissenters. The FBI's documents deploy this emotional epistemology as well, and likewise bolster the affect with a kind of taxonom taxonomic and enumerative frenzy. What's crucial to understand here is that the hyperbolic state emotionalism and pseudo-positivism are cast as exaggerated to the degree to which the secret invisible dissenters have pushed the state. This is why this is why it has been useful for me to think about the emotionality of our contemporary nation-state relation in terms of the prior anti-communist moment. Then, as now, an incoherent and skewed jumble of oppositions between patriotic sentiment and dissenting dogmatism, patriotic resolve and dissenting weakness, and the openness of democracy and the secrecy of terror slash communism were mobilized by power elites in the political public sphere. Then, as now, the emotional clarities of the powerful sought to shame out of existence the kinds of open argument and dissent that makes nations live democracies in practice. As now, the suspension of the spirit in the letter of democratic law was deemed not to be a proactive program of constraining liberty, but an emergency suspension of law in order to save the law from secret subversion. Infinite Justice, The War on Terror, and the Fear of Formlessness Recent work on HUAC describes anti-communism as a concern that played a relatively small role in the lives of subjects and citizens who had no access to the kinds of economic and institutional power and influence of political elites and insiders. In contrast, public responses to the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon distinguished themselves through a style of moral psychology more explicitly centered in notions of faith and community-based norms. In the public rhetoric that emerged during and after the events, the mix of emotionality and positivism of the Cold Warriors persisted, but this time the orchestration came from the televisual and radio journalists before the state had a chance to pull itself together. One result of this shock of, actu of actually live liveness is that the emotional tone of the collective response was set normatively prior to any responses in terms of policy. Greg Myers' work on the production of the American Vox Populi shows that it was as though the putative transparency and hardwiredness of emotion was the event, or at least the event the audience could understand, about which we could know first know facts. Immediately, the press used the language of we, of our feelings, of a, and of an our history that presumed the global viewing public to have become American post-traumatically, as Le Monde went on to say, by virtue of having witnessed the violent anti-American trespassing on U.S. territory. Please note that I am describing the centrality of emotional experience to the production of patriotic publicness, not saying that there was something scandalous in the immediate normativity of effective nation rebuilding that went on and was recorded by the media. Not scandalous at all, in fact. It was the business of feeling national as usual. 
Quickly, though, the administration borrowed the sensationalist energy from the media's nationalization of trauma. The subjects of imperiled privilege were at this time identified to court as ordinary innocent Americans, and the Bush administration repeatedly equated justice with the demolition of the, at first, unnamed and invisible perpetrators who created Americans as a species haunted by the terror. Meanwhile, his administration assumed the rights to all satellite photographs from Afghanistan, asked the press not to show live pictures of any of the terrorists, and kept secret and without due process the prisoners they took from the wars of, from Afghanistan and the United States. And while developing the terror muscle of the body politic, the administration underfunded the Office of Homeland Security and any project of national defense put forth in its name. Deleuze and Guattari argue that the paranoia is the appropriate subjective response to the iconic hypervisibility of the fascist state. From the contemporary U.S. governmental perspective, paranoic moralizing is the appropriate response to the opposite condition, dissenting invisibility. Terrorized, the state performs the feeling of sudden national boundary collapse from fear that the enemy is not one but many, not somewhere but everywhere, not located but mobile, not identifiable but protean, not just isolated but woven into the fabric of everyday life. The war is on terror, and not simply fear, because fear has an object, while terror leaks potentially into all spaces of experience. The administration then asks citizens to feel terrorized too, and likewise to be hypervigilant in everyday life, taking up position as the state's disciplinary deputies. In other words, whether or not it makes sense to call fascistic the government's defiance of the letter and spirit of U.S. civil rights and international law during this period, it claims to be mimetic. Its embrace of secrecy as security is mimetic as well. As the enemy is perceived to have no shape, to produce an enigmatic and therefore lawless anti-American crusade, then the U.S. state too must assume a kind of hyperbolic formlessness. The war on terror renders that aura of, dissolution, aura of dissolution and promises, at the same time, to return transparency, form, boundary, law, and the normative way of life to the world once the shapeless dark forces have been defeated. Predictably, as the two towers fell and melted on 9-11-01, an actual actuarial, imaginary, uncannily similar to that of the HUAC mentality took shape in the U.S. public sphere. So many killers, so many dead, so much property value wasted, so many tons of garbage, so much more of X, and so much less of Y, where X equals U.S. righteousness, patriotism, insecurity, anger, and trauma, and Y equals U.S. innocence, ignorance, naivete, security, civil liberties, freedoms, and so on. The numbers kept changing, but the comfort of actuarial proclamations seemed to assure knowledge and the continuity of a U.S. imperial agency amidst the improvisation that trauma inevitably causes. Daily, the State Department issued a color code, code red, code yellow, etc., that tells us how intense our terror of terror should be on any given day. The broadcast of these codes was not accompanied by strategies for surviving actual violence. Be terrified of what you don't know, but leave the knowing to the state. Meanwhile, the state acts rationally when it can, but assumes the moral and political right to trump counter-arguments with emotional clarities and law with enigmatic policies in order to defeat the morally public but bureaucratically secret and terrifyingly spreading anti-American forces. This dialectic between what what's frighteningly formless and the statistical production of quasi-already normative reality saturates the non-governmental post-traumatic scene in the United States as well. For instance, following on discussions about reparation to unjustly treated Native, Japanese, and African Americans, a public conflict persists about whether the families of those killed in New York and Washington deserve payment, about how many millions each life lost is worth, and to which person the worth goes. A similar question of corporate rather than corporal reparation was raised with respect to the airline and insurance industries, as well as for New York City itself. When ordinary people are killed as innocent Americans, tort law and a utopian tradition of cultural guilt for national wrongs converge in a flood of uncertainty as to the ethics of actuarial judgment. In stark relief to this frenzy of value assignation, the negative space where the buildings were is termed ground zero, and in stark contrast again the U.S. military response was, at first, called infinite justice. News conferences are held where predictions as to the cost of the war are pronounced, then revised. There, then there is the nationalist drama of the interest rate, the stock market, the recession and recovery, with their jerky dynamics and magical qualities that seem to denote future or even faith in national and global boom and bust. And then there are, are the presidential approval poll figures. That number keeps changing, 
that numbers keep changing matters not. We may be balancing on a bubble, but whether it bursts, leaks slowly, or continues to expand, what will matter is that this mathematical anti-sublime keeps shaping the terms of the quid pro quo in the political public sphere in the spirit of the post-traumatic lex talonis. An eye for an eye, a primitive contract shaping the rhetorical terms of just revenge by reference to the traumatic woundings of the flesh. In short, enumeration is central to constituting the national present as a continuous site of urgency, in which experts encourage hunting, gathering, and hoarding value against terror's shapeless and negative affectivity. Mary Poovey writes that this tendency to name, number, and make accounts as modes of accounting for vast social phenomena is intricately involved with what counts as modernity. Normativity, the statistical ballast for capitalist flux offered up by the consensus and the tax roll, made it possible to draw a line at a particular time slash space called the here and now. In this space, modern identity would appear as a standardized ratio of intelligible qualities and the modern state as a set of property relations and reciprocal obligations. Normativity describes the ways that these facts of social being came to seem like social being's foundation, the basis of personal and collective continuity. Modernist normativity was about, as they say, time passing into an unprecedented sensorium, aesthetic or fortist, autonomous or exploited, those dialectical pairs whose continuities in the optimism of ideologies of mobility or self-cultivation made the past into something that happened long ago. In contrast, postmodern geographers suggest that the post-fortist world of the present, also disorganized by capitalist flux, operates according to an unprecedented degree of time-space compression and an incitement to speed up, a phenomenon akin to liveness. In this regime of experience, the present is not a contained or unprecedented space of time, but one that calls out religious and science fiction metaphors about living in con continuous alternate, alternative chronologies that tend all too intensely towards the contingent and the sublime. Pasts leak into futures and vice versa in a way that threatens to destroy the capacity to live historically in a material way, leading to intensified problems of survival. I detail three kinds here. First, a powerful sense that power is deracinated, organized elsewhere in some non-reciprocal offshore location or in the cave of a shadow government, rubs up against a sense that lived spaces continue to matter more than the power that has no face. This means either that the value of the local is constantly felt to be expropriated by national capitalist slash global formations, or that the local is felt to survive in the authentic habits and habitations of ordinary people, despite the expropriation of their labor value by capital. Empire, or that old saw, the ruling classes. Any point on the local global grid so imagined is, at the same time, a point of political powerlessness and irrelevance. irrelevance. That the Bush Jr. administration de deifies the local in contrast to the national participates in the effective rhetoric of apolitical and ahistorical moral clarity that the right wing wants to attach to national, national patriotism. The second survival blockage concerns the identity form, or the relation of ethnic, racial, and sexual specificity to singular individuality, often called sovereignty, and often linked with U.S. national identity. At present, and in both directions, this relation of identity, collective subaltern individuality, to singularity, one specific history protected as individuality by national rights by the national rights form, tends to be marked as a relation of authenticity to depersonalization and violence. Chela Sandoval's Methodology of the Oppressed most cl clearly describes this crisis in the obstacles to a critical experience of the present. She argues that what feels like the current threat to the sense of control by the elite feels like the ordinary conditions of consciousness and survival among the subordinated classes. The events of September 11th further intensified the anger of the privileged at being made to feel constrained in their treatment of historical minorities. If we are all, more than ever, Americans, why did the subalterns and liberals insist on creating figures that need not be there? As a result, the structural inequality that governs everyday life in the United States is drowned out in battles over symbol symbolization, and identity politics is misidentified as an elite movement in contrast to the vernacularity of Anglo-American supremacy.
Third, this crisis in historicity and social connectedness works well for the maintenance and reproduction of the hegemonic bloc. For the regime where a sense of local cultural and economic ordinariness that feels manageable, resistant to capitalist appropriation, and irrelevant to the political mainstream works beautifully to enable the increasing consolidation of wealth, wealth in the hands of a very few global citizens and corporations. At the same time, the sense of comfortable, contained, and controllable ordinariness can be remobilized at any time as newly vulnerable to a crisis in the present that demands a new citizen sensorium on behalf of the collective or national continuity that protects what has been designated the taken for granted, the social conditions for the experience of that mirage and normativity's naturalness. In short, the taken-for-granted, or normative neighbor of the ordinariness that is the ordinal, is said now to be so at risk that a state of emergency must exist for the foreseeable present, which is synonymous in times of crisis with the foreseeable future. In this regard, the world in which public numbers are deemed neutral is at risk in the same sense that clichés seem at risk. The desire to return to the world before crisis is displayed as a desire for dead facts or transparent truths. How is the idiom of affect, affective nationality related to a contemporary politics of ordinariness then, and what is its relation to the liveness of mass trauma and the vernacularization of politics? Usually, ordinary locality is manifest in the sense that events are continuous, taking place in the flow of, to use Bourdieu's phrase, practical activity oriented towards practical functions. I am arguing that the mass experience of national vulnerability reveals what was already true, that both workers and ordinary property owners were never in control of the conditions of their continuity and value, but because this time the logic of that contingency is not a capitalist but national, the ordinary is re redefined as that horizon of the taken for granted that is protected by national sovereignty. The Bush administration wants the nation form deemed central to the survival of ordinary life, while hiding its commitment to the reproduction of structural economic inequality. Thus follows the right-wing argument that the nation can go on securing the right to feel autonomous, local, self-sovereign, and ultimately unhampered by the political, only if the administration proceeds unopposed. Tom Dumb argues that ordinariness usually coordinates multiple temporalities that flow into each other as the taken for granted, but which nonetheless are not entirely continuous, but contrapunctal and shadowy. Memory, habit, labor, practice, fantasy, all the processes involved in the reproduction of life, the chaos that might ensue from the jumble of temporalities, is shaped by the ways normative modes of subjective tracking locate continuity in particular cross-sections of stories that impact personal and public versions of the self, sometimes to fray their distinctions and other times to insist on them. In contrast, national trauma is ordinariness's other in that it is a sense of experience of enmeshed distinctions, too. At stake in the post-traumatic citizenship ideology of the moment is a project of making citizens who actively feel and feel political, but only on behalf of their future reprivatization. National sentimentality frequently works against the political in exactly this way. The genre of liveness most symptomatic of the depoliticization of patriotic politics is most available on the cable news networks. Regardless of whatever particular diegetic news is being broadcast on any given television, televisual news outlet, we can now expect that the stock ticker, long a convention of the representation of capitalist instability in the public sphere, will reappear as a news ticker, a conveyance for sentences about simultaneous events that may, on reflection, seem of all different scales, but which have been flattened out as urgent messages streaming below the image. Colin Powell in Palestine is propped next to a baseball score, and succe succeeding that is news of the opening of the internet kiosk at the Iowa State Fair, a dog show in New Mexico, news, new news about diet. Newly nationalized biography becomes similarly factualized, as for six months after September 11th, the New York Times published a daily segment called The Nation Stunned, containing a series of pictures, each decked with a biographical caption, describing the ways a given deceased occupant of the World Trade Center was good, loved, and lovable, and had ordinary habits and dreams, and who th therefore deserved, after all, to have lived. There was no reason to do a close reading of these stories or the images that they accompany. The scale of this personhood genre made it possible for any reader to identify with these people, who represent not objection or bare life at all, but potential human value unrealized. All of the occupants of that building complex have not yet been so narrated, and the obituarial series has now been made into an occasional piece. 
The cessation of the imperative to witness daily the value of these lost lives suggests that, from the New York Times point of view at least, it became time for the public to pass into something almost beyond the event, post-traumatic, but not quite ordinary in the old sense. Actually, starting from three days after the event, newspapers and newsreaders conveyed the president's view that it was time to return to business as usual, although business would never be usual again. Why did the nation slash state slash media want people to slouch towards ordinariness? First and foremost, citizens were said to have a duty as consumers to bolster the economy that both performs U.S. health and consolidates U.S. wealth in a way that stabilizes its sovereignty amongst nations. This decaying margin, this calendar of convoluted histories, this timeline of territorialized events was sutured to ordinariness almost instantly by both the televisual intensity of September 11th and the insistence that these consumers, after all, needed to vote for American freedom by intense amounts of shopping. New markets in flag paraphernalia burst out everywhere, but most important to the success of the state project was that as the subject reemerged into ordinariness, she or he felt viscerally transformed towards the practice of popular citizenship. Protest was seen as treasonous, but appearing on the street as a typical citizen of capital, a producer and consumer, was given the highest regard. To summarize, at present the political sphere of the United States is saturated by the deployment of emotion to convert the nation from liveness of politics at the t to the time of moral clarities that actively trump nuancing dissenting counter-narratives. Along with consolidating national power, this emotional epistemology creates a decaying border where sovereign subjects are hailed to experience an astigmatism in the patriotic gaze, a post-traumatic terrorized perspective from which one looks back on a time of moral innocence acts free in small, ordinary ways, and continues to feel historically saturated by an immediacy now l less and less grounded in unusual practices of monitoring on CNN or Fox military violence or the cleanup at Ground Zero. From this fold in time, one remembers the initial impact in a visceral way, but feels overwhelmed by considerations of ongoing practical agency in response to the stimulus of injustice. Those matters have been appropriated by the right-wing government, whose aim is to represent the public in a moral emotional way, bracketing representation of the more socially conflictual debates about who deserves what resources. Harnessing public feeling to the moral clarities of the parallel universe where faith and evil battle it out can generate a certain consoling rhythm that makes it possible to count the everyday as the space of survival, shedding a real-time social imagination of a better good life. But the end of the count, three, two, one, signals not the end of the bad time, but the beginning of bad time, the polity reeling, or should I say reeling, from so many technical knockouts that the state abrogates laws, rights, and norms of justice on behalf of its fight against the very terror it foments. Live. In this administration, the state markets such emotion as the space where authentic voting takes place. Consumers of history's live parade, living in the astigmatic, mismatched, jagged domains of the new, forced ordinariness, holding on to the domestic ballots, ballast of the everyday, we are asked to participate in the mass intimacy of strangers across a political sphere in which the political is delegated to leaders who lead us away from the instabilities of nuance while feeling as comfortable as sheep who are counted on the way to political sleep.